I'd like to apologize profusely for skipping ahead in the lineup a while ago. Uh, we will hear from Captain Robert Salas, uh, but first we have a real treat. We have one of the uh, top Latino authors from the Rio Grande Valley, uh, and also known nationally, has won a number of very impressive awards, including one just a week or so ago, which we are very ha happy to hear about. Dr. David Bowles uh, will be speaking today on the Border X-Files, and I've heard him give this presentation be uh, before, and it will send chills down your spine. So, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Bowles. Man, I tell you what, it's really tough to follow Marta. That was really, really awesome. She's such a, an awesome woman. I remember uh, my, in my childhood having my very first crush on a TV star, coming home from school and watching those little precocious six, seven years old, all, already all in love with Judy Robinson. Um, so yeah, as Noe was saying, I'm from the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, about If you get on uh, Highway 83 and drive for about six hours south, you'll run close to my house. And uh, my, my parents are both from down there, from McAllen, and um, my family is Mexican-American on one side and Anglo on the other. So I grew up with a lot of these really, really fantastic stories that kind of pushed me into um, reading and literature and a lot of the things that I've done um, that have eventually led to my um, doing a lot of study of Mexico, its culture, religion, um, pre-Columbian literature and language, translating from Nahuatl and Maya and so forth. Um, but I keep coming back again and again to the, the folk tales and legends and hauntings and so forth of the border areas. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. The border is kind of a focal point for the unexplained. So many weird things. I was just having a wonderful conversation with a couple of guys who are hunters in this area and some of the encounters that they've had recently. And it seems like the border is just, just seething with that sort of, of strangeness. And um, th we had a conversation a couple of uh, hours ago, uh, a guy, right there you are, right there, uh, over at the table about why borders are the way they are, why are they um, seeming focal points for the strangeness. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in my uh, studies of Mexican tradition, and I'm a, uh, a professor at the University of Texas, uh, Rio Grande Valley, um, in addition to being a writer, and so I, I do a lot of these studies and talk about this stuff to my classes, and there is this uh, tradition of the inexplicable in, in Mexican culture and of places of water, uh, ge geographical borders, not geopolitical borders, because who cares that it's the border between Mexico and the U.S., except, I don't know, people who are worried about that kind of crossing. Uh, but for, um, for the purposes of mythology and legend and the inexplicable, um, borders are an important crossing place. The, the Maya believed that water was a conduit to another world. Uh, I, I was just in uh, the Yucatan Peninsula a couple of weeks ago, um, the last week of December, the first week of January, visiting a lot of the cenotes, these uh, huge sinkholes in the karst hills um, in the southern part of the, well, I guess the southeastern part of the Yucatan Peninsula. And they were seen as portals to, to the underworld, to Xibalba or Metnar, depending on the dialect of, of, of Maya. There's also this Mesoamerican concept that comes from the Aztecs of Nepantla, of in-betweenness, of whenever, whenever you have a, a crossing from one sort of place to another, there's always this in-between zone, which reminds me a lot of what uh, Bob Schroeder was talking about this morning in the, the spaces between dimensions. Um, and there is this crossing back and forth between that Nipantla. The borderlands then, in the Mesoamerican, in the pre-Columbian Mexican tradition, that has come all the way forward into our Mexican-American tradition today, our Latino tradition, that my grandmother Garza inducted me into as a child, is that borderlands are magnets for the strange. And rivers, like our Rio Grande, Rio Bravo, are metaphysical borders. 
And during things like the Aztec months of the dead, the Aztecs had actually two months, they didn't have a couple of days, they had two months dedicated to the dead. Um, it was expected that bodies of water and border places would see the crossing of spirits and demons and other types of beings. So all this kind of plays together. And some of our traditions along the border, and you see some images here from um, my good friend and collaborator, Jay Melendez of Duendes, Lechuza, and, and Nahual. Because one of the um, you know, part and parcel of this kind of interesting uh, milieu that we live in are these stories of non-human beings in this area, all along the border of the southwestern United States and northern Mexico. One of the ones that I heard about the most when I was a kid and that I was convinced sometimes had invaded my home and were waiting in the walls were duendes, the little folk, right? And these stories go all the way back to, to Maya and in, in North America and in in what's now the, the continental United States, a lot of Native American um, First Nation tribes had very similar uh, traditions. Small diminutive beings that would visit, it, would visit uh, humans, steal babies away, things like this. Sounds a little familiar, right, if you're a, uh, if you're a UFO enthusiast. We also had Naguales, or shapeshifters. And shapeshifters is a tradition that goes back thousands of years to the Olmecs. We don't have any of the language of the Olmecs. We don't uh, know too much about um, who they were, what they looked like, but we do have the, the buildings that left behind the temples and the stele that have these carvings of were jaguars and other types of humans in transition. And even to this day, we have stories all, all along the border about this. Um, just a couple of years ago in Rio Bravo, right across the border um, from where I live in Donna, Texas, uh, people were complaining of a man who could assume the shape of a huge black dog um, attacking women and, and then transforming into a man to, to do ungodly things to them. Um, so, and the other thing that a lot of you have probably grown up with are the stories of lechuzas. How many of you guys grew up hearing about lechuzas, right? Lechuzas are a type of shapeshifter that is um, usually associated with a witch, somebody who is doing harm to other people. <clears throat> what, what I want to talk to you guys about today are and perhaps not these more traditional uh, things that, that have their roots in Aztec and, and Mayan lore going all the way back to um, to early traditions thousands of years ago. I want to talk to you about four major X-Files, unexplained, really, really strange stories from the Rio Grande Valley. The first one, this is one of my favorites, it's such a neat story, it's the sea monster of Port Isabel. It's one of those stories that has slipped through the cracks of history and people don't know too much about it anymore. Here is a, an artist rendition again by Jay Melendez of this creature and you'll see um, a shark in its jaws there to kind of give you an, an estimation of scale. So this is in um, August of 1938. Um, we hadn't quite entered uh, World War II. The Nazis were ramping up in power. Things were, you know, kind of getting dark in the world. Fascism was on the rise. Imperialism in Japan, um, you know, people, China was beginning to feel the wrath of the Japanese. But here in the Rio Grande Valley, I mean, here in South Texas, in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, a few uh, hours south, we had our fishing rodeo going on. That was, that was, those were our priorities. I don't know if you guys are into deep sea fishing, any of you, but it's really, really big down by the coast. And uh, to this day, we still have these marlin um, deep sea fishing tournaments. Back then, they were called fishing rodeos, which is a kind of cute name. I don't know. I don't, no one's going to be actually lassoing uh, a swordfish, but. <clears throat> That's what they called it. Charlotte Sewell had just moved to the valley with her husband. She was from upstate New York. She had spent her, her youth fishing with her father in lakes and rivers and so forth. She's a huge fan of fishing. She got married to uh, an oil man, moved to Texas, then they eventually moved to the, to the valley. Um, and she wanted to continue with her interest in fishing, so she started like in resacas and and the river, but eventually she began to get interested in this deep sea fishing stuff. Um, she got uh, involved in it, learned how to do it, went out on some boats, and finally she entered in 1938, the, um, oh, I guess she entered in 1937, and became the, the champion of the women's division. In 1938, her goal was, I'm not just gonna be the champion of the women, I'm going to show men 
that a five foot two inch woman can put them in their place, can fish just as well as them. <clears throat> so everybody was gearing up for it, getting their ships ready, getting all their, their equipment ready. When fishing boats start coming in, was reports of a monster in the Gulf of Mexico along the, the coast near Port Isabel. The first people were kind of dismissive, dismissive of it. A lot of these boats were captained uh, by Mexicans. They were from Mexico, a lot of them. And people were easily dismissed that, oh, these guys are out on the, you know, on the ocean, they're drinking a little bit too much, they see something kind of big, they're freaking out, it's a monster. But ship after ship came in with their catches and their nets ripped away and no explanation. And they just kept talking about this massive thing that they never really got a good, um, really good eye on, they didn't get a good sight of, stealing their catch and almost tipping their boats over and so forth. Reports started coming out in the Brownsville Herald, and Charlotte gets really, really interested. Can, you can imagine what she's thinking. If I want to show up men, if I want to show them that a woman is, a, is just as good a fisherman as a man, what better way to do it than to catch a sea monster? You know, the kind of sea monsters that used to be on the edges of maps, right? Here there be monsters. <clears throat> so she convinced one of these fishing boats to take her out on an exp expedition. They loaded up the boat with empty barrels to serve as, as a way to, to keep the, the creature from diving under. Once they'd shot it with harpoons, they had tons of, of rope and, and lots of harpoons. And they went out in, onto the Gulf of Mexico to catch this monster. Now, word started getting around that she was heading out, and other people not wanting to be left behind, and especially men not wanting to be shown up by a woman, be they began to put together their own little teams. And before you knew it, you had an entire flotilla of ships going out onto the Gulf of Mexico, adults in the year 1938, going out onto the Gulf of Mexico to capture a monster. It, it was, they were ecstatic, it was all over the news, people were like just giddy with the excitement of, you know, maybe it's a huge, like, shark, prehistoric shark, who knows what it is, but everybody wanted uh, a, uh, a try at it. I mean, you even had, like, the mayor of Port Isabel and all these uh, city councilmen and so forth from, from the area going out on the ships. Everybody wanted to, to be the one to, to reel it in. Well, days and days went by, and one by one, the boat started returning, kind of chagrined, you know, nothing had been seen. They didn't know what to do. Everybody else had come back except for Charlotte Sewell. And there was some speculation as what happened, but eventually that fishing boat came limping back into port. No barrels on board, no rope, no harpoons, just her getting off and not wanting to answer any questions. And when they asked her about the sea monster, she was like, what monster? And just like left. The following year, she tried again with the fishing tournament, but it seemed like her heart just wasn't in it anymore. And she had a child. And from what we're able to determine, that she asked her husband a couple years later to please move away from the valley. She had gone out one last time. No one knows exactly what happened. No one knows what she saw. No one knows what she saw the first time. But just a couple of years, 1940, the, we're on the very brink of, of war, you know, the, the, the uh, Nazi party has taken over Germany, all these horrible things are happening. And they move to Dallas, far away from the ocean, and she never goes back to the ocean again. And so there's speculation uh, as to what happened, what did she see when she went out that first time, why were there no barrels? And when she went out for that last time, two years later, what happened then? What happened? to scare her away, to make her want to, to move as far from the Rio Grande Valley and the Gulf of Mexico as possible. Because, as we all know, I mean, in Dallas you get lots of stuff, but you're not going to get any, you know, sea monsters crawling up onto your house. So this is a really, really fascinating story. Um, a story of a woman's heroism as well as just this unexplained story. Because after that, it was never seen from her, uh, uh, never seen or heard from again. And there's a lot of speculation about what it might have been. It's an X-File. Maybe someday we'll figure it out. But right now, it's 
kind of like the Gulf Coast Nessie, if you will. There's another artist interpretation from uh, my story when it came out in the Monitor, a newspaper in the, in the Mid Valley. And you could see, this is supposedly Charlotte Sewell's boat dwarfed by whatever creature popped out of the water. Another interesting story is the story of the one-eyed woman. Again, another one of these X-Files, one of these unexplained stories. Here is an artist's interpretation from uh, Carolyn Flores, who's a, a great illustrator and an author. This happens in the, in the late 1950s in McAllen. Um, everything starts at Molina's grocery store, downtown McAllen. A, a woman emerges with her groceries. She goes to wait for the bus at the little uh, bench that's sitting out there. And as she's sitting and waiting, an old woman comes and sits next to her. And for the longest time, you, you know, you might just, if somebody sits next to you, sometimes you just go, hey, whatever. You know. After a while, she just felt the need to like look up and she turns and this woman stares at her and the woman has an eye in the middle of her forehead, which is disconcerting to say the least, right? Not something that we're used to. And you guys probably have heard a little bit about the idea of a third eye, about beings with a third eye and their ability to see into the future and things like that. And, um, but this young woman was just frightened out of her wits and she immediately jumps up, throws her groceries all over the place, runs back into to Molina's to, to, you know, to call for help. The owner comes out to see what's going on. Of course, there's the food spread all over the place, but the woman is gone. Um, a little while later, a taxi driver on 23rd Street in McAllen is driving along looking for a fare when a woman darts out into traffic. And he almost hits her. He slams on the brakes. He's all, you know, freaking out. And he gets out of his car and kind of shaking and worried that he's hit this woman, waves down someone else, and the person gets out and they go in the front to investigate. And of course, the woman is gone. A little bit later, there's a, uh, an apartment in Ratama Village Apartments, one of the oldest complex in McAllen. A woman is taking her child. When there's a knock at the door, she goes up, she looks through the little uh, diamond of glass at the front door and sees this woman with one eye staring at her. And the woman is like trying to tell her something. And every one of these incidents, the woman is about to say something. She's raising her hand, she's opening her mouth to speak, and the people are freaking out and running away. And this is what happens here. The woman is trying to say something to her and you know, she freaks out and she runs to her phone and calls the police. By the time they arrive, she's not there as well. Things come to a head with what happens to a little boy that day. He has gotten in trouble with his parents who have a store also in McAllen and he's sent to wait in the car while they close up shop and he's sitting in the front seat when he feels something behind him. He turns and there is this one-eyed woman staring at him. And then of course, this boy who must have been like eight, nine, 10 years old, something like that, um, shrieks in fear and she finally is able to say something to someone. She says, espera, wait, no te vayas, don't go. And the kid calms down and relaxes and the woman tells, tells him, be careful of your little brother. There's gonna be a fire. He turns back around, he's shaking, he's like reaching for the door to get out. And his parents come and his sister comes and, and his little brother and they all get in the car. But the woman is not there in the car anymore. They go home, uh, he, his parents go out that evening. They leave him with his sister and his little brother. And with this heightened sense of anxiety because of the warning that he's received, the boy can't go to sleep. And he gets up, he's, you know, wandering the house when he, he smells smoke and he finds his little brother who's gotten his father's matches, his father smokes a pipe. And he's lit a fire in, in the living room and there's a ring of fire all around this boy. And it's beginning to spread and go up to the drapes. And the, this boy who got the warning is able to grab his little brother call his sister and get out of the house. And there's enough time for a neighbor to come in with garden hose and 
put out the fire and so forth. So what a lot of people believe because of the boy being saved at the end is that this woman was some sort of um, messenger that, that in some way she was aware of the future, she had been given information, and she was trying to warn people. And although I don't know it with certainty because I haven't been able to track all the stories down, but the, the, the rumor is, or the, the legend is, that these other people to whom she appeared that did not heed her warning, did not want to listen to her, something bad happened to every one of them within a week. And so it's, it's one of those eerie stories that I grew up hearing and that no one knows the answer to. It's an X-File. Here's another artist's interpretation of that, that woman. And she was like a little, as we say in Spanish, a little indita, right? Like a little Native American woman, super short, very old, very, you know, dark-skinned. The chupacabras. Everybody loves the chupacabras, right? Oh, I love the chupacabras. Chupacabras is like, uh, he is like the, uh, the mascot of the bazaar in, in Mexico and in, in Texas now. Here's a, an artist's interpretation of the chupacabras, done by my friend, a, a painter from Monterrey named Noevela. And this is like the way that, that this creature was described a lot in Mexico um, during the uh, presidency of Salinas Gortari, who a lot of people called the chupacabras because he basically drained the blood of Mexico, right? Drained the lifeblood of Mexico. And some people even said, there were lots of rumors, I don't know how many of you guys have ties to Mexico or relatives of Mexico, but while Salinas uh, de Otari was in, was in the presidency, lots of people say, used to claim that he invented the story of the Chupacabras to distract people from his horrible administration and, and, and the, the theft that he did. The guy ended up in Scotland, right, like millions of dollars out of the national treasury. But in reality, the Chupacabra, we know where the Chupacabras came from, or at least we know the where the stories of the chupacabras originated, and it wasn't Mexico. Obviously, the, the question with the chupacabras is, okay, what is it? Is it a cryptid? Is it an alien? Is it like some kind of hybrid out of a lab? Uh, because carcasses that, that have been discovered have lent um, scientists to, to, to say some things about its genetic identity that I'll talk about in a minute. But the chupacabras first appears in 1975 in Puerto Rico. Um, a large number of sheep were found dead that year, drained of their blood, um, and they all had these peculiar marks on their neck. But there was, for a while, for a while after, and at that time, no one had any idea what it was. The people in Puerto Rico were like, es un vampiro, you know, a vampire running around sucking the blood out of goats. I don't, maybe, don't they do that like in Twilight? Is it like Edward, like go drink the blood out of like cougars and bears and stuff like that? Why he didn't like pick rats, I don't know. We don't need people killing bears, stupid vampires, right? So yeah, no, I mean, it seemed very unlikely that, <laughs> that we were talking about vampires. 20 years ago, uh, uh, later, in 1995, the killings start again. This time, people were like, pay close attention to it, and they find these marks on all of the creatures that have been killed. Um, three puncture wounds in this kind of upside down triangle shape. And a woman named Madeline Tolentino is the first eyewitness that sees one of these creatures and she describes something much much like what i saw what i showed you guys in the previous slide a, a creature of about a meter high about three feet high uh big large glowing eyes spines down its back kind of a hopping way of getting around i don't know about you i mean the hopping is kind of amusing like just thinking of this thing like uh, hopping around like a kangaroo at first makes you kind of amused but just like a kangaroo will lean back on his tail and kick you to the moon, you know, chupacabras, you might be slightly amused at first if it hops by you, but when it like bears its fangs, it's, you will cease being amused, I think. Well, something happened in 1995 in the early 2000s because reports of Mexico started to spread like wildfire. Um, and there are some really, really insane, harrowing things that happened in Mexico. One of the worst attacks happened in July and August of 2010, 300 goats and sheep were, in, uh, were killed in the, uh, the area in and around Zapotitlan, a city in the, the state of Puebla. Can you imagine 300 goats and sheep? Ranchers 
Shepherds, they were pissed off. They wanted to know what was going on. They demanded answers from the government. They had the state and federal police like going, combing the countryside looking for these chupacabras that the ranchers said that they had seen. But they had, they had moved on, apparently. They were not able to, to find the creatures at all. And it is around this time, weirdly enough, that you start having a profusion of sightings in the Rio Grande Valley and the rest of the border region of Texas. Um, the, the story of the Lozano family is one that I find really interesting. They live in Mission, just north of Highway 107. And um, Frank Lozano, Francisco Lozano, has his little you know, family ranch there. And what started happening was, as he would do his rounds on horseback, you know, checking the edges of his property, making sure that the fences were all fine so his, um, his cattle wouldn't get out, he began to find dead animals. Usually in, 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 in um, extreme states of decomposition, so it was, he was unable to tell why they were dead, um, but he would find them, and of course, you know, he would bury them, burn them, throw them off his property. <clears throat> and it was concerning to him, but he didn't worry about it too much until one morning he found one of his heifers, freshly dead, lying in the, in the brush with three marks on its neck, basically drained of blood. He called his, his sons, his, his oldest sons together and said, look, we've, we've got to burn this and then we're going to have to like, start keeping watch because something is preying on animals around here and it's been emboldened by my not doing anything about it and now it's attacking our, our animals. It was, they, they started finding chickens dead and, and some of their goats went missing and um, this was the, the last straw, this, this heifer. So they began to, to, uh, to keep watch and rotate and, and, you know, do the rounds of their ranch. And slowly, the thing seemed to disappear. And so Frank Lozano, like, eased back on his watch. The family relaxed. They, you know, got themselves a, a, another cow and, and moved on. Now, during uh, white wing season that year, one of his compadres, who had been annoying him for the longest time, Frank, vamos a casar. Invite me to your ranch so we can, you know, shoot some, some white wings. Um, they, got their, they got their license, and his, his compadre came, parked his truck at the entrance to the ranch, and they went off and, and bagged a couple of birds. As they were coming back to the, uh, the trucks, though, you know, they had their shotguns broken over the crook of their arm. And they were getting ready to, you know, to toss their game bags into the truck and, and go have a beer to celebrate. When this strange thing began to slink its way through the open gate onto Frank's property. And the way he described it was kind of like a coyote, except with like leathery blue-gray skin, a very, very knobby back with like, like quills coming off of the knobs, and paws that were not like coyote paws, they were, they were strange with longer digits that dug into the ground, and like very strange stiletto-like teeth. The thing comes through, it looks at Frank, Frank looks at it, and it crouches down as if to attack. Well, he doesn't think twice. He, you know, closes the, the breech on his gun, uh, shotgun, lifts it, the thing leaps at him, and he kills it. And he throws it into the bed of his truck. And so here we have an opportunity, because what he says to his compadre, his compadre is like, oh shit, you just killed the chupacabras. <laughs> and he's like, I don't know what the hell it is, but we're gonna, go, we're gonna find out. I'm gonna take it to some experts. And so, um, he, and, and you can actually find um, some original interviews and so forth with him online. Um, so look up Frank Lozano, Chupacabra's mission, you'll, you'll hear the story in his own words. He took it to some experts, they took a look at it, and, they, and what, what he claims they've said is that the creature has coyote DNA, that it is basically a coyote, but there are genetic markers that they can't explain. Something in addition to the coyote DNA, which makes you think. Because a lot of people are dismissive of the chupacabras. And, and like I was telling somebody um, earlier, I, I'm, I'm kind of skeptic about these things. But I'm a skeptic in the good sense. A skeptic in the good sense is somebody who says, look, you know what, I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no, I have an open mind. Tell me your story, show me your evidence. I'm willing to, 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 to consider anything. And that's the way I still am about this chupacabra stuff. But the idea 
that pe people just want to dismiss it. They're like, no, no, there's no way. It's just they're just coyotes with mange. Some of the stuff that the, some of the behaviors that are being described, the drinking of blood, the marks on the necks of these creatures, are not easily discounted. You know, you didn't you didn't have like a group of mangy coyotes killing 300, uh, you know, farm animals in Puebla. That's not what happened. It's something else. And so. You know, who knows what it could be? Is it an experiment gone awry? Is it, you know, some people want to, to suggest that some of the genetic markers are alien. Maybe there's some way that aliens embed their, embed some kind of DNA into human organisms and this is what happens. You get some kind of weird creature as a result. Whatever it is, it continues to be cited. And you can see all kinds of really unusual stuff on the internet about the chupacabras. I find them very interesting because they're a modern phenomenon. This is an artist's depiction of the chupacabras on, on Frank Lozano's property, killing his heifer. It's pretty gruesome. <laughs> Again, the guy did this uh, for me for a version of the story that came out in the paper. Not the kind of thing you'd want to meet, right? Out in the dark, and, you know, out hunting somewhere. I got my friends in here who are, or who are who hunt like wild pig, and I don't know if they'd want to bump into this guy. Okay, so the, the last border file I want to talk to you guys about is the big bird. When you hear the big bird, what is the first thing you think of? Sesame Street. Right. Now granted, if the big bird from Sesame Street like pops out of nowhere when you're like, you know, on the ranch or the sister are walking down your street, you're going to be freaked out. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking the big yellow bird. We're talking about this <clears throat> anthropomorphic flying creature that, um, that attacked people in the, in the 70s along the border. Here's one artist. This is a very fantastical artist interpretation that an, an, an artist friend of mine named... Uh, Mario did. No, Mark, Marco Sanchez did this. Well, January and February 1976. Now, this is happening in the Rio Grande Valley, lower Rio Grande Valley, close to Browns and stuff. Uh, my dad was in the Navy. We were, not, we were not in the valley at that time. We had moved temporarily to South Carolina because he was stationed at Paris Island. Um, but we were getting phone calls every day about this. It, this, is, this is truly, truly a crazy story. So, January 7th, you've got two San Benito policemen, Arturo Padilla and Homero Galvan, separately patrolling the area. And they both see this strange winged form that they describe as like being giant, having leathery wings and a kind of simian face. Separately, they see it. That same night in Brownsville, which is the next city from, from San Benito, Alberico Guajardo sees this bat-like creature as well. So you've got three people the same night seeing a massive winged creature. The word starts getting out. First it's, you know, contained to the police station. They don't want the word to get out. A couple of the patrolmen have maybe been hitting the bottle a bit too much and hallucinating, whatever. Um, but a week later, Armando Grimaldo of Raymondville, a, a, a town that's a little bit, well, kind of like a, in a triangle, if you will, from San Benito and Brownsville, is attacked by something. He says that it swoops down out of the sky, its claws extended, it tries to grab at him and lift him up, and he runs away, the back of his jacket is ripped open, he's screaming, his neighbors come out of the house, so there's like no time for him to make this up. He's screaming in his yard, his neighbors come rushing out, and they find him sprawled in the, gr in the grass, well I guess it's like dirt probably, <laughs> with these claw marks through his jacket and his shirt. Very, very strange. After this, because man, he goes to the media. He's, he's scared. He goes to the media and it just, there's an avalanche of reports. People start seeing it all over the place. Um, there are a, group, a group of teachers driving to San Antonio see this thing. And being science teachers, they think they know what it is. They're like, we saw a pteranodon. It's like a little mini uh, pterodactyl, right? We saw a pteranodon. And people are like, what, a prehistoric creature from millions of years ago, flying over the Rio Grande Valley? But they swear up and down that's what they saw. 
At this point, national media picks up the story. Johnny Carson on The Tonight Show makes a joke about the big bird in the Rio Grande Valley. We've like hit the big time, right? South Texas is now the brunt of a Johnny Carson joke. It's hilarious. A reward is offered. And then once you start offering money, once you throw money into the mix, as we say in Spanish, ya valió, right? It, it, hoaxes start popping up all over the place. People like make stuff up and, and it gets a little tricky and people start getting a little wary of of people's reports. And, and this is kind of like what um, Noe and Ruben were talking about with Area 51, right? When you get people who like want to latch on to the popularity of something by like making stuff up, oh, it's so irritating. Because then the people who really have something to say that they've really seen something, their voices get lost. Man, there was even a corrido about the big bird. You, you know that it's made it big time when there's a cor el pájaro grande. El corrido del pájaro grande. For those of you who don't know what a corrido is, it's like a, like a lengthy narrative song about the, you know, the adventures of some larger-than-life person, right? Um, it used to be, they used to be sung about like outlaws and so forth. Now, unfortunately, they're sung about like cartel members, like whatever, like they're heroes or something. Mm. But there was one about the, the big bird. Now, here's where the story takes an interesting turn because you had experts kind of flooding the region trying to find out what's going on. Like, you can imagine what happened. Lots of um, ornithologists and biologists know that ornithologists studying birds. Because there's a suspicion on the part of scientists that what we're talking about is just a very, very large bird. And lo and behold, they, they do capture a jabiru, which is the South American stork. It's huge, very big uh, wingspan. And people are like, see, it's just, people are just freaking out. They see this massive, a stork-like creature, and it's dark and it's flying overhead, and their imaginations fill in the rest. They also film a large blue heron that's native to Texas, and it also has a very, a very large wingspan. But there are a lot of people who say, look, so there are big birds in Texas, but they're not the big bird. You know, those things can be here without being what people saw. Now, like I said, we were in uh, South Carolina, we got phone calls every day. I don't, some of you may be old enough to have, have heard about this on the news. The parents were keeping their kids in, like they would start getting, you know, the sun would start going down and like pull their kids in, they were scared to death of it. Um, there was a, a bit of a panic. But my dad would get phone calls every day from his, his uh, family and his, his friends. And one day his compadre called him and told him a story that kind of blew my dad's mind. And I was, I had just turned, um, six years old, and he hung up the phone, and he goes, I can't believe what just happened to my compadre. And so he told my little brother and me and my mom the story of his, his friend. So apparently, his friend went, uh, was, went deer hunting with his 12-year-old son. They went to a, a deer lease, they got up into the stand. Um, you know how it is. It, it was an uncharacteristically cold morning. This, the the Feb February of 1976 was, had some record lows. And they're waiting up in the stand um, for you know the perfect buck to cross uh, into their view. And as the, the hours wear on, um, it doesn't seem like anything's going to happen. When finally, this beautiful buck steps right into the clearing, and the man is the, he's excited and he's like, and he, he, he takes aim to fire and his rifle jams. So he, he nudges his son and he's like, you know, you take the shot. But the boy, I mean, he's 12, he really doesn't like hunting. He was dragged out there by his dad. He has absolutely no interest in actually killing a deer. And so he's looking at it, and, and, and he just can't. He can't shoot it. And his, and his dad's like, take the shot. Ya dispara. But he can't. And then all of a sudden, the deer like, bol like freaks out and bolts and runs off. And his dad turns to him and like now, you know, talking loud since the deer's run off, he's like, what the hell is the matter with you? Why didn't you take the shot? And right as he's saying this, his, the, the boy's father is yanked out of the stand into the air. This is my dad's compadre, and this is what he claims happened. This bird has grabbed him, this big bird, this strange um, anthropomorphic you know, flying creature. And he's being like, held above the, the deer stand as the thing tries to fly off with him, you know, beating his wings desperately to, to try to fly. Well, the boy wasn't able to take the shot before, but now he like raises his rifle, takes aim at the creature, and shoots it in its eye. And it lets go of his father, and the guy crashes to the, 
to the, the, the wooden planks of the, of the deer stand and then flies off into the night. And it wasn't, you know, like the, the following uh, day that my compadre called my dad and told me the story. So it's, it's really, really weird when you think about how dismissive people are of this, of this kind of thing, that there are people who will swear to you and have had physical encounters. Because I can see a bird, like, you know, a, a big like, bird of prey trying to pick up, you know, I don't know, a cat or, or some relatively large mammal, but a man, it's kind of, it's kind of insane. And it makes you think. Of course, I was six years old at the time. My dad's compadre moved away. I haven't seen my dad since I was 15, so I can't really ask him a lot of questions. But when I wrote the story up as best as I could remember from memory, hoping that this guy would eventually read it, well, it was, it was picked up by the producers of Monsters and Mysteries in America, and they, they um, included it in their episode of uh, Flying Humanoids, and interviewed me. It was interesting to like, become an, like a national expert on winged humanoids. It wasn't something, when I was doing my doctorate, it didn't occur to me that it was going to parlay its way into national famous expert on flying humanoids. But it was, it was a great episode. They did a good job doing the recreation. The special effects are great. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to check it out. But, um, and I've consulted with them a couple of episodes, although I haven't like provided any more stories because I don't have like a bunch of personal stories to share with them. But any of you guys that have the stories, and I've already talked to a couple of you, hey, you know, Email me and I'll hook you up with the producers. They're always trying to find um, eyewitnesses to crazy stuff. So the Big Bird, an amazing story. And, and what's really cool about the Big Bird is that after that, it's, there, was, there were no more sightings. But guess where sightings started up? In Mexico, in the state of Nuevo León, to the south of Monterrey, where my wife is from. And in Monterrey, for like ages, I don't, I don't know if anybody's from Monterrey here, it's unlikely, but maybe there's somebody. But for the longest time, there have been stories of the, uh, of the man bird, the woman bird, el, el hombre pájaro, la mujer pájaro, that would like attack people. They would live up in, in, the, in the hills, the mountains, and they come down at night and they attack people. And of course, I'm sure that many unfaithful a man coming home with scratches on his face and back <laughs> has used the the bird woman is an excuse. No, honey, no, no, it's not what you think. I was, I was attacked by the bird woman. Yeah. But now, in recent, it's starting around 2010, and you can actually find um, video of reporters talking about this. They have begun to talk about El Pajaro Grande and, and the, the, like the ranches to the south of Monterrey. So apparently, whatever this creature is, after all the attention and it being shot, I guess, maybe, may have returned to Mexico. Here's another artist's interpretation of the, the flying humanoid. Some wild stuff. If you're interested in reading more about the kinds of things that, that I've done research on, here are, here's just a little overview of some of my, some of my uh, work that you can take a look at. Um, out in the um, lobby right now, the only book that I brought with me, because the one, it's the one that's most related to this talk, is uh, Border Lore. Folk Tales and Legends of South Texas, and, it, and it's got the story, of the, the four stories that I was talking to you about right now, it's got those written up, and another 21 um, stories. So basically my favorite dark legends, the, the unexplained, strange uh, myths and legends and urban uh, folk tales that I grew up listening to, and that even as an adult I've continued to hear. I also, um, back in 2012, worked with uh, Peña Nueva to come up with this book called Mexican Beastry Bestiario Mexicano. It's a, it's a bilingual book, and although it's intended like, to be accessible for all ages, it was more specifically written with teenagers in mind. So, um, especially teenagers who are bilingual, who are struggling to learn English or whatever. It's got 40 different um, legendary creatures and monsters of, of myth and so forth from Mexico and the U.S. Southwest. So it's, it's kind of like an encyclopedia, basically, with 40 different entries in it. And the way it works is there's kind of like some background, an explanation of the creature and so forth, and like a, a small story or anecdote to kind of to give people an idea of, of what it was like. Right now I'm working on um, a book called Ghosts of the Rio Grande Valley, and um, I'm under contract with the History Press. When Border Lore came out and, and you know, 
the, the episode of Monsters and Mystery in America and so forth, History Press contacted me because they wanted, they said they feel that they don't have enough uh, work because they do a lot of regional history and regional folklore and stuff. And they, they feel like they don't have enough from South Texas, from the border region. Um, so for example, it'd be wonderful if they did a book about this area, you know, Del Rio, Eagle Pass, stuff like that. I'm sure there's all kinds of awesome um, hauntings and folklore and so forth. I know just from the presentation that happened uh, right behind, right before um, Martha's presentation, that there obviously are people who are actively investigating the paranormal here in this area. And so I know that I can, I can tell you the History Press is definitely interested in, in getting out more books about the border. They, they, they contacted me, which is, it's always nice. Because usually as an author, you have to like knock on doors and, and like try to sell yourself and, and convince people, hey, come on, you know, I have this great project. Um, and for the longest time, I didn't have an agent, but now I do. And so this is going to have 17 of the eeriest hauntings along the border. It's the, the four county area that makes up the lower Rio Grande Valley, right? So we've got the story, for example, of the, the haunting of the mansion of uh, John Sherry, who was basically the owner of most of the property. Like, he bought off all of the uh, Spanish land grants um, in the late 1800s and then resold all. He bought it for like a like a pittance from the actual families and then resold it to, to Anglo uh, people who were coming down to settle. And he apparently, I mean, he was, he was a big deal for the longest time and apparently his uh, ghost is seen still sitting in his rocking chair on, his front, on the front porch of the Sherry Mansion. Uh, and so there's some interesting stories to tell about that. There's a little chapel um, called La Lomita that's not too far away from there, um, cl close to Mission, Texas where supposedly the ghost of, of nuns and the illegitimate babies that they had with priests, the, their ghosts still haunt this place. And so, you know, looking into that. So a lot of really, really creepy, crazy stories um, about hauntings in the Rio Grande Valley. From, and there's also like the Harlingen and, and Sainath Island. There's all these really, really fantastic haunted places in the area that I live that I'm writing up for the History Press. And I don't have a cover yet, but the, the same guy who did the artwork um, for Border Lore is, is collaborating with me on this. Now, I know that a lot of you guys are also fans of like science fiction and fantasy and other speculative stuff, so I thought just really quickly, since I a captive audience, I'll share a little bit about, about some of my other work. I'm also a writer of science fiction and fantasy. I've had stories published in, in tons of different um, venues. Um, I've got a, the, the first collection of those short stories coming out this spring, um, I think around May, if I'm not mistaken, it's called Chupacabra Vengeance. So this is great. Uh, don't you just, the title is awesome, Chupacabra Vengeance. So it's got science fiction stories, fantasy stories, um, some horror slash weird stories that have had published different places. Um, this is from the back. Cholos and alien hordes, undead luchadores, children trapped in animal form, legless vampires, Aztec merchant spies, a deadly ancient codex. From a pre-Columbian wilderness to an ice-choked future, from haunted borderlands to post-apocalyptic ruins and all the lush but vicious worlds between, these 15 tales reveal the hidden courage, despair, and depravity of people forced to face the darkness. Some overcome, a few surrender, the rest are consumed by vengeance. And so the, the title story, Chupacabra Vengeance, is actually about the Zapotitlan um, Chupacabra attacks in 2010 and how they push a girl and her brother um, to, to travel on La Bestia, you guys know La Bestia, the train right that, that traverses Mexico, to come to the U.S. and their encounter with Chupacabras on the border. It's kind of a crazy story. And then there's a, a, a future, like a post-apocalyptic kind of Mad Max story, but with Chupacabras. All of it is like very Latino themed because it's you know, the way I was raised and so it's hard for me to write without having Latinos, you know, Mexicanos, Tejanos, to be part of the stories. And I, I love this cover, again, by Jay Melinda's man. This guy, he's, he's, he's an up-and-coming artist. He's doing great stuff. Um, and I've got some other uh, science fiction and fantasy stuff out there. If you ever, if you ever like to read free stories, you can go to, to my website, davidbowles.us, and I got, I got links to a lot of my stuff there. Um, no, we mentioned really quickly that, that I just want, I, I've won a couple of awards from the Texas Institute of Letters, from the Texas Associated Press, and I just won an award from the American Library Association. Holy crap. That was, that was, when they called me, it was like two weeks ago, it was like a Sunday, my wife and I are sitting there eating, 
the phone's, I'm, I'm 21st century guy, so I've got my phone sitting on the table next to me. It's really bad. Well, if my wife across from the, like you're not supposed to have your phone out when your wife is sitting across from you, especially when she cooked for you, you know, what the heck was I thinking? But then the phone starts ringing, it's just like lighting up, because I have it on time. And it's Boston. I don't know anybody in Boston. I can answer this probably like a bill collector or telemarketer. And then it rings, it rings again, and I ignore it. And then an instant message uh, from my uh, editor pops up, and he's like, David, answer your damn phone. It's the American Library Association. They're calling you about this award. And so I called them back. I was like, nervous. I'm like, I'm the American Library. Because I, I knew they had requested copies of my book m months before that. But I had no. It was like, whatever, I'm not going to win an award from American Library Association. Because it's like winning an Oscar. Okay? That's really cool. And so they were like, they had me on speakerphone. It's like, yes, we're the, the Pura del Pre um, Award um, Committee. And we've selected your book as the, the honor author book for this year, which is like, there's a gold medal and there's a silver medal. And I got the silver medal. It's like incredible. Like sales of my book like skyrocketed like overnight. It was, it was a wonderful thing. It's just, I feel like a little kid in a candy store, like, ah, oh, it's so exciting. And so the book that was selected is the first in this series, The Garza Twins, which is a, a YA fantasy series. Like, a lot of you guys probably have read it to kids, or some of you who are younger have read yourselves. You know, all the Harry Potty, Harry Potty? Wow. That's like, like that's the rated X version of the Harry Potter books. The Harry Potter books, the, you know, Twilight books, the Hunger Games, the Percy Jackson, all that stuff. I read those with my kids, we loved them. One of the things that I was always kind of disappointed in was the, like, the lack of Mexican-American characters, like the Latino characters. And the fact that the, the gods and monsters and so forth, they're, they're always European, right? Vampires, werewolves, Greek and Roman gods, oh God, it's like it's getting old. And I used to complain to my kids, man, wouldn't, wouldn't it be awesome to open the book one day and have like a Latina fighting like chupacabras or going up against like Lucilo Pochli, the god of war. And they're like, yeah, dad, that would be really cool. And then, you know, it was, just moaning and groaning about it with some of my friends who are writers, and I'm like, dude, think, obviously you should write it. You feel passionate about it. You should write it. I'm like, wow, I don't, I don't know why it hadn't occurred to me. So I wrote the series. And the basic pitch is, once a millennium, twins are born with the ability to shapeshift and wield the might of savage magic. When Carol and Johnny Garza discover their powers, they find themselves fighting to save their family and the world itself. And so the first book, and look, so we get this like, nice fancy sticker. The Puro del Pre Honor book for 2016. The first book is called Smoking Mirror, um, and it's about how Johnny and Carol have to, well, they discover their shapeshifters and they have to descend into Miklan, the Aztec underworld, to rescue their mom, who's been taken captive. And then the, the second book is coming out in April, it's called The Kingdom Beneath the Waves. And here you can see they obviously have to go underwater and assume the, sh the, the shape of um, a merfolk in order to to fight a rogue prince who wants to flood the world and destroy humanity. So it's a lot of fun uh, working on those kinds of things and gotten some really good response. And to me, it's really important as a Latino, as a father of Latino children, as I was a teacher for 14 years before you know, moving into uh, college education and public school administration, to make sure that like, Latino kids have books in which they see themselves, books that show Mexican American Latino kids doing you know awesome adventurous magical things and not just like being in the hood in the barrio like you know there, there, there's room for books that are about kids you know, being migrants and facing up against the hardships of discrimination but I wanted to have books about kids who are heroes who who work with their family to like overcome like like major darkness and so forth and that's what these books are all about and I think it's one of the reasons they've gotten such a good response so there's the, e there's the email address. There's the, the website, davidbowles.us, and on it you can get um, my email address if you want to email me or anything like that. Okay, so there's about five minutes, and if any have any questions, you can shoot a question at me before we get Captain Salas up here. To, oh man, he's, he's pretty awesome. Yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, I, I, I didn't actually, um, so the question is about lechuzas, I'm just kind of mentioning them in passing. But lechuzas, I mean, that was like the major, other than La Llorona, that was the, the thing that my grandmother was scared with the most. When I was a little kid, my cousins and me would get dropped off at my grandmother's trailer in McAllen next to what's, next to La Plaza Mall, back when there was a trailer park right next to it. And uh, she would scare us with this kind of stuff. 
don't go, go by the canal on Bridge Road, porque está la llorona, and she will come up out of the water, think you're one of her kids, and drag you down and drown you. And then she would tell us about le lechuzas. And she would tell us, I have a comadre who's a witch. And if you mess with me, if you're disobedient, if you make me, I'm gonna tell her, and then you're, one day you're gonna wake up and it's gonna be a lechuza outside your window, and it's gonna come for you. And it's really funny, because this stayed with me for a long time. I, I was, um, in the summer between eighth and ninth grade, we moved to Westlico, and I was, Kind of, I was being kind of a horse's ass about it because I didn't want to move from McAllen for my friends to Westlake where I didn't know anybody. And so my parents, as a gesture of goodwill, they let me have the garage as my bedroom. And they kind of fixed it up. But the garage door was still there with its like kind of dingy plexiglass windows. And the laundry room was right adjacent to it. So if the door was open, I could look through the laundry room, out the back door, at the mesquite tree in our backyard. And then out the dingy windows, there was an ash tree in the front yard. And one night, uh, I was up really late reading, I think it was Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, which may have influenced the way I felt that night. And I went to sleep, it must have been like one, you know, one o'clock. And after like a, about 30 minutes or an hour, I woke up kind of startled, felt like somebody was looking at me. I turned to the right and looked out the window and there's this huge screech owl, which is what a lechuza literally means, a screech owl, sitting on the branch of the, the miscreech. I'm like, what the heck? And it just stared at me. And it, and see, and what my grandmother used to tell, tell us was, if it stares at you and says nothing, then you're safe. But if it opens its beak and lets out its, its screech, you're screwed. Because that's, <laughs> it's coming for you, right? Now, there's some things that you could do. One of them is to curse at it, right? So I'm like, pinche lechuza de mierda, and I should slam the door shut. Go back to sleep. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, again, feeling like something's staring at me, and I go, and I'm like looking up at the dark and I like turn like this, look out the ninja windows and there's the damn bird <laughs> on the ash tree in the front yard. And I'm like, you know, this is probably nonsense. It's probably just some bird. But like, why would the bird fly from the backyard? So I cut my blanket and my pillow, ran across the house to my brother's bedroom where my two brothers were asleep. And I laid down on the floor and it was like, they woke up in the morning, found me on the floor. And they were like, oh, the big boy who wanted to have the garage is his bedroom. <laughs> has to get up in the middle of the night and run to his little brother's bedroom for protection. <laughs> Shut up. But yeah, so Lechusas, you know, there's definitely, I have a story about Lechusas in Border Lore. That they're, one of the things that's most fascinating to me, um, one of the big stories that I grew up hearing. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay, one last question. Yeah, real quick. What about the reports of uh, the many T-Rexes that have ever been? Holy moly. Yeah, no, I heard about that, but I, I have to do more research into it. One of the things I've been, and like I was telling you about, one of the things that's really interesting to me right now are the sightings of Bigfoot in Mexico on Popocatépetl, on the volcano. They were, they, there was a team there, uh, there was a rescue team, up in the snow, up on the, in, on the slopes, and they see these huge, like, furry, um, kind of like upright gorilla things just dashing across the snow like nobody's business. Probably nearly three meters tall, nearly nine feet tall. And they're like a pair of them together, and they kind of like turn and look down at them, whatever, and then they rush off. I had that, um, I did a, a series for the Monitor for the newspaper called uh, Creature Feature. I do it like basically every year, and this year, one of the things I did was to tell the story of Bigfoot on, on Popocatépetl. And the Bigfoot story like, goes all the way back to the, to the Mayan times. The, they talked about the, the Chewinik, the, the man of the forest, and I think it's related to that. Thanks so much for, for listening to some of these crazy stories. Um, I know sometimes you might think to yourself, oh, connections with UFOs, but it's all about what the unexplained and opening our minds to things around us that because of our rational, ordered, civilized lives, we sometimes ignore. Um, and it's nice to take a look into the shadows and see what might be you know, waiting there and, and try to face it and, and deal with it and understand it. Thank you very much. David, thank you so much. I think I would rather face an ET, an ET than a Bigfoot. That's my, <laughs> my opinion. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost there, but we've got two more very important speakers, the dynamic speakers.